Welcome everyone. Welcome to part two of my Powerbox Spark Switch RS video. Now, this video is going to be ho focus heavily on the technical side of things, so hopefully it won't be too boring for the viewers. Um, I've just got my Spark Switch RS here. It's connected to a receiver via bus connection, as I showed you in part one. And for this video, I'm going to be sending an electronically generated pulse signal into the RPM port, and we're going to view the cores display to see what sort of RPM readings we get with the type of signals we put in. Um, I'm not going to be running an engine as such, so I'm using a Hewlett Packard synthesizer which generates, I can generate various pulse trains, various signals, and I'll be uh, setting up uh, different frequencies and we'll have a look on the cores display to see what RPM readings it gives us. So basically this cable here would normally go to your tachometer output for the ignition. However, in this video, I've got it coming over here. It's going into an adapter here. So this is just an adapter. And I've got a coaxial lead that goes off to my synthesizer, which I'll show you in a second. So the signal will come out of the synthesizer through here, goes into the servo lead. And I've also got an oscilloscope probe connected here uh, to the signal cable. So I've got an earth connection, and I've connected it also to the signal lead. And that will allow us to view the actual signals on an oscilloscope as well. Just to um, highlight some issues I've noticed with my SATO ignition module. Well, not really an issue, but just some um, different waveform to what I thought it would put out. Um, anyway, let's go and have a look at my synthesizer. So over here is my uh, Hewlett Packard synthesizer. So this device here allows me to make customized uh, waveforms and I can set up a pulse train. For instance, I can make up a servo signal like a PWM signal if I want. In this case, we'll just set it, we'll be setting it for some basic pulses at different frequencies. And um, if we know the frequency of the signal, we then should be able to calculate the RPM by, uh, you know, for frequency, say, 50 hertz. And uh, we multiply that... Um, that's 50 times a second, a pulse 50 times a second. So to convert it to RPM, we just multiply it by 60 so that it should give us 3000 RPM, for instance, on the cores display. And over to my left here, I'm using one of my uh, oscilloscopes. I've got a number of oscilloscopes. And I just thought I'd use my Tektronix oscilloscope uh, only because it's got a nice display. It's got some cursors. And uh, I'll put my other camera on the crow screen. Crow's oscilloscope for short, and we'll have a closer look at the screen later on when we actually put some signals into the um, spark switch. Okie dokie, um, I might just switch over to my other camera now, and sorry for the uh, phone hand-holding bumpy sort of video at this point in time, but I'll switch over to my other DSLR camera and we'll focus on the oscilloscope screen. Okay, let's zoom into the oscilloscope screen so you can get a better uh, view of the waveform. And at the moment I've got a um, just a standard pulse going in. The uh, We can measure the pulse width. So um, if I change my cursors here, for instance, if we have a look at one of these pulses, it's approximately, you know, bit over five milliseconds at the moment, so nothing too uh, narrow. And if we look at the actual um, uh, frequency, if I move, say, if I go to the falling edge of the first pulse, and then go to the second falling edge, or the second pulse, see it's actually 50 hertz. Um, if I move the cursors... So I'm feeding in 50 hertz at the moment into the um, RPM port of the uh, spark switch RS and if you look on the uh, cores display we can see uh, pretty close to 3000 RPM so um, it's a uh, 2 RPM out so I might complain to Richard uh, I think 2 RPM is not a problem um, my equipment's locked to a frequency standard so it's pretty accurate um, so the core must be wrong just a bit of a joke anyway um, 3000 RPM. How do we get 3000 RPM? So we're feeding in, like I mentioned before, 50 pulses per second. We want to convert it to minutes, just multiply by 60, because basically there's um, 60 seconds in a minute. 
and if we multiply 50 by 60 you get 3000 3000 RPM now with this pulse generator I can change the frequency I can change the pulse width as well so for instance if you look at the oscilloscope screen you can see the pulses changing in width I can go narrow or wider I can play with it all day long um, what else frequency I can show you frequency as well so it takes two steps if I double the frequency so let's go to 100 Hertz just bear with me got to push a few buttons okay so now we have 100 Hertz and you'll notice the um, RPM readings now are reading 6000 because 100 times 60 is 6000 and if we look on the oscilloscope screen um, if I go to frequency oops wrong button I was on frequency so let's have a look if I go between the two rising edges got about 100 Hertz uh, listed on the uh, on the display and um, that of course equates to 6000 RPM which is basically uh, what we're reading on the cores display um, 6000 RPM simple as that okay so one of my first curiosities when I was playing around with it was how high in frequency can we go before the unit stops counting and what I found we can get to about 12,000 RPM or just under 12,000 so um, if I go to just under 12,000 so let's go to let's go to just over 11,000 okay I'll just expand out the display and if we um, look on the actual oscilloscope display got about 190 Hertz going in and we've got about 11,400 RPM and you notice the reading on the um, cores display is quite stable not a problem however if we go a little bit higher if I go to um, let's go a little bit higher I'm just going to increase the frequency slightly just bear with me while I push buttons on my synthesizer so now I've gone to a slightly higher frequency not by much so it's just under 200 Hertz I should say and you'll notice the reading still reasonably stable but it's a little bit jittery but fairly stable still and let's go a little bit higher again so so this is getting close to 12,000 rpm obviously um, oops let me push the right buttons 98 ignore the waveform on the screen at the moment because um, I'm still pushing button okay now it's locked and um, let's have a look at the frequency now it's about 198 Hertz and notice got 11,876 still reasonably stable still pretty happy with that so let's go now a little bit higher so go frequency um, Bear with me. There's no knob on the synthesizer, it's all button pushing. Now you notice I've just gone up in frequency a little bit, so I'm just under 12,000 RPM. So you notice the oscilloscope screen hasn't really changed much. Matter of fact, you know, it's, I've only changed it a little bit, so it's very hard to discern the difference on the oscilloscope screen. However, you'll notice the cores display the RPM readings all over the place. Um, it's not well it's sort of stable but then it jumps around a bit so what I found is the limitation for the RPM input is about um, in effect roughly 12,000 Hertz or uh, sorry 12,000 RPM which is um, uh, 200 Hertz so if you've got a square wave going in that's 200 Hertz into the actual RPM input it pretty much doesn't like it so it's got to be under 200 Hertz or 200 cycles a second so that's just one thing to keep in mind so if you had a little small motor for instance that spins up at you know 30,000 rpm and it's got one pulse per revolution um, it's not going to work <laughs> simple as that however with these ignition modules we tend not to use them with very small engines they tend to be larger engines so they all tend to have rpm limits you know under 10,000 usually 
Um, so it shouldn't really be an issue, but just something to be aware of. Uh, it's just something I picked up in my testing. Okay, so one of the other tests I wanted to do was to see how narrow a pulse can be fed into the spark switch and still have it counting properly. So what we're going to do now, I'll drop the frequency to something a bit more reasonable. So let's go back to say, um, uh, I don't know, let's go to 6000 RPM, which is, um, what's that, uh, 100 hertz. So I'll just change my counter so it outputs a lock signal at 100 hertz. Push a few buttons. So now we've got a pulse train. Um, again, if I go from the trailing edge to trailing edge, um, you'll notice 100 hertz, and uh, you'll notice the uh, cause display is now locked at pretty close to 6,000 RPM. So I'm happy with that. But what we're going to do now is I'm going to narrow this pulse down and to see how narrow we can go before the unit stops functioning. So let's let's expand this pulse out so we can see it. And I'll just move it over over one division as well. And what we're going to do is I'm going to change the cursors now. So now we're going to be measuring pulse width time. So at the moment it's about 2,800 microseconds or 2.8 milliseconds in width, which is reasonably wide. And what I'm going to do now is um, change the uh, pulse width. And let's start, I'll drop it down in large increments to start with. And let's go down to about there somewhere. I'll just expand out the timing scale again. Might just turn up the brightness a little bit since it's a little bit faster now. And let's see the uh, pulse width now. It's about, about just over 330, around about 330 microseconds. So that's a lot narrower. And if you look at the display on the core screen, that's still functioning fine, still measuring 6,000 6, RPM. So I haven't changed the frequency, I'm just narrowing the pulse range down. Okay, so now I'm just going to go to a slightly smaller step. And let's keep reducing down again. So go roughly down about there. Let's expand the time base on the oscilloscope out a little bit. So now it's about 185 microseconds or whatever. And... Um, the display is still very stable on the core, not a problem, it's reading that fine. Let's go a little bit down again. Again, unfortunately I don't have a knob, I've just got to push buttons on my, on my uh, synthesizer. So now let's increase the uh, brightness again so you can see it okay. Let's move the cursor. What do we got now? Got about um, almost, yeah, close enough to 100 microseconds. And yeah, look, it's still counting fine. So 100 microseconds is a reasonably narrow pulse. It's not super narrow in electronics terms, but it's reasonably narrow for our, our equipment. So let's go down a little bit further. So let's go down to there. Still working okay. Let's go down a bit more. At what point will it fail? Okay, there you go, it's gone there. So if I go back up one step, it's working there. So it's working down to about, what's that? Um, if I go to the trailing edge, if I get it roughly right. Should have used my digital crow for this, eh? Hey? Um, so it's about 54 microseconds. So if I drop down one increment below that, um, that's when it... It's stopped working. So you notice the display on the core now has gone to zero because it's not counting anymore. And that's because the pulse is too narrow for the electronics. And if we um, move my cursor there, so it's about, you know, 48, say close enough to 50 microseconds. So it works there, which is just over 50 microseconds. So at about 54 microseconds or say 55 microseconds, it's happy. But at 50 microseconds, it's not happy. Now, this is one thing I picked up with my Sato engine. So my ignition module on my Sato engine puts out a very narrow pulse. And I had trouble with it um, working with the spark switch. 
and it wasn't until I introduced the um, RPM probe. So you can buy a little accessory for your um, spark switch. So the RPM probe, if I get that into the picture correctly. Um, if you get one of these, this acts like a signal conditioner for the RPM signal. And on some ignition systems, I think it's DA for instance, you need to use the RPM probe with their sensor. Because they use a Hall effect sensor and it has like a low or a weak output, which is fine for their ignition. However, you need to use this RPM probe sensor in series with the RPM lead for the spark switch. So basically, um, conditions the signal and increases the voltage and also it changes the pulse width. And I'll show you an example with my Sato ignition module on my Sato engine, how it all, it all works. And we'll see that on the oscilloscope um, in a second. Okay, so what I might do now is, um, if you're happy with that, I might just switch over, I'll connect my Sato ignition module back up and we'll, we'll do a test with and without the RPM probe so you can see the effect of the RPM probe um, on the actual signal that we're feeding into the spark switch. Okay, let me change my setup. Okay, we're back to the uh, phone camera, so sorry about the wobbles. Um, I've got my Sato engine there again as per part one of the video. So I've reconnected the ignition module and um, this, this is the power lead for the ignition module. It connects to the ignition port on the, um, on the Spark Switch RS and also the sensor lead, so the RPM output lead from the um, Sato ignition module. So this is one of their single cylinder small ignition modules, uh, not to be confused with their larger brethren, the uh, three cylinder ones. Uh, so the RPM lead goes straight into a, a power box lead and I'll, I'll attach my oscilloscope probe to the signal wire in a second so we can have a look at the signal coming out of the Sato ignition module for the RPM monitoring and then that, that feeds into the RPM port of my uh, spark switch. Simple as that. So what I'm going to do is, as I mentioned yesterday, on the actual uh, crankshaft pulley you notice there's a little magnet there. So the magnet goes over the sensor. So every time it goes past the sensor, which is this little black plastic thing here, it's a little Hall effect sensor, so it's sensitive to magnetic fields. The ignition module fires a pulse for the spark plug. So what I'm going to do is basically move this as fast as I can backwards and forwards over the sensor to see if we can get some sort of RPM reading on the core. And we're also going to have a look on the oscilloscope display and have a look at the signal, what the signal looks like, because it's not going to look like the nice signal that we saw on my um, uh, oscilloscope with the synthesizer. Um, it's going to be narrower, and I found that um, this ignition module doesn't quite work when it's connected like this straight into the um, RPM port. So if we take the lead, the monitoring lead, the tachometer lead from the uh, Sato ignition module, and plug it straight into the RPM input here. Um, it doesn't measure the RPM pulses. However, um, you'll see after I'll attach the RPM uh, probe, the optional extra from uh, Powerbox, which is over here, and we'll see what effect it has on the actual signal on the oscilloscope, and you'll see that the RPM reading will then work. Now when I rotate this with my hand, we're not going to get a really high RPM reading will just get a couple of hundred RPM if I'm lucky. So it should get it like two or three hundred or maybe four or five hundred depending on how fast I can move this backwards and forwards. Obviously I'm not going to rotate it all the way around because I wouldn't be able to rotate it very fast. However, just by going quickly backwards and forwards like this over the sensor, we should get some pulses and a reading on the uh, core screen. Okay, let's um, switch back to my oscilloscope screen and have a look at some signals. Okay, let's have a look at what the uh, Sato ignition module puts out. So let's switch the ignition on. Now this is one of the first things I noticed. So before I was testing with a positive going pulse from my uh, synthesizer going into the spark switch. However, when I was testing my Sato ignition module, I noticed that, let's switch it on now, you notice the uh, trace has gone up to the positive rail. So if I switch it off, and if we can measure that voltage actually, so um, 
this is with a uh, 6 volt supply so just off some inner loops and um, let's turn it back on again to see the maximum so I'll just bring in that cursor so it's around about 5 volts going into the module at the moment and um, let's get rid of those cursors now watch what happens so I'm going to rotate the um, the magnet or the crankshaft over the um, sensor really quickly and if you look really really carefully you'll see some narrow going pulses so I actually measured one of these pulses using my uh, digital oscilloscope earlier and it's actually quite narrow it was around about 80 microseconds and remember from our previous testing you get a bit too narrow um, and then the shape of the pulse is a bit of an issue as well so it didn't like this pulse because it was too narrow um, and the rising edge was uh, you know a bit wonky as well so this is just me mucking around just rotating the uh, crankshaft backwards and forwards over the sensor really quickly so you should be able to see the little spike so the pulse is actually negative going so it's going uh, down and uh, again hopefully that comes out okay on the camera and what we're going to do is I'm not going to change the settings of the oscilloscope but we're going to put the RPM um, probe in series with the sensor lead and we'll see what effect that has on the trace so I'm doing this here if I move it fairly quickly and you'll notice the um, the display on the core is not really doing anything even if I try and move it really really quick as fast as I can just to get a you know little bit of a reading on the display but there's just absolutely nothing and the spark plugs firing I checked that so the ignitions working fine it's just that the pulse is not quite uh, good enough as far as the uh, spark switch is concerned so let me switch it off so what I'm going to do now is grab the little RPM probe that you can see here so this is a little option and we're going to set put that in series as per the uh, instructions now I'll leave the oscilloscope connected and let me plug in a few cables here Get the right ones. Just bear with me. Don't want to plug anything backwards here, so just triple checking my connections. Okay, so that's now connected. So I've got the RPM probe connected. So basically, that's in series with a tachometer output lead from the uh, Sato ignition module. And let's switch it on and have a look at the trace now. So let's turn the equipment on. So now I've just switched it on and you'll notice the trace is now down low. It hasn't gone high like it was going before. So um, let's see what happens now when I move the... Uh... Now have a look at that pulse. you notice it's a lot wider and it's positive going. So the main thing is it's a lot wider. So basically the RPM probe has stretched the pulse. So it's conditioned the pulse basically. So it's accepting a narrow pulse in, but it's giving a much wider pulse on the output. So hopefully that's, yeah, you can see that on the uh, screen okay. So it's a much wider pulse if you compared it to before. Now, let me see if I can switch it fast enough so I can get a reading on the uh, cause display. Ow! I just got an electric shot from the spark plug. 30,000 volts, thank you very much. I'm trying to hold it with my hands here. Let me... The spark plug connector wasn't on properly, so I just copped a boot. Not much fun. <laughs> I've had many electric shots over the years playing with Tesla coils and that. So now I'm trying to move it as quick as I can. And you'll notice it, the screen's erratic, but it is getting a reading. So I'm getting, what, about 400, up to about 400. Can I go a bit faster? 600 I saw there quickly. 700. Yeah, so basically it's working. So now it's picking up the pulses okay. Um, and I've also got a 30,000 volt boot in my hand to boot. Not much fun. But um, like I said, I've had many electric shocks from uh, mains and all sorts of stuff. Because I've uh, been involved in electronics for many years. So you tend to cop a few boots from electricity every now and then. Okay, so that's pretty much it. Um, like I said, I just wanted to highlight a few um, 
uh, things with my Sato ignition module. And, you know, in this case, I have to use the RPM probe if I install it in an aircraft. Um, other than that, the system works fine. And you'll notice the, uh, the display on the core that was reading OK, um, especially when we were using the synthesizer because, um, you know, with the synthesizer, that's feeding in a nice clean signal, which I could control. And, uh, yeah, the unit works really well. It's, it's a great little unit. And it's really up to um, you guys whether you want the regulated version or the non-regulated version. Um, I've had a look inside the unit, so it's very well made. Maybe I'll take a few photos one day of inside the unit and put them up on, on the uh, YouTube channel as well. But very well made, um, good electronics, uh, soldering's perfect, you know, excellent, excellent construction techniques. It's got a little heatsink on the rear, doesn't really get very warm. Um, yeah, go for it. And um, yeah, stay tuned for my next video and thanks to everybody for watching this bit more boring technical video. Hope you enjoyed some parts of it anyway. Thanks, thanks for watching.